This is The Future Of, where experts share their vision of the future and how their work is helping shape it for the better. I'm Jessica Morrison. And I'm David Blaney. And today we're exploring online identity before birth and after death. That we can read a Facebook message supposedly posted by a deceased person sounds a little creepy, but there are apps and chatbots that actually create social media posts post-mortem. To discuss the ethics and the future of this trend, with us today is Associate Professor Tama Lever from the School of Media, Creative Arts and Social Inquiry at Curtin University. Thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure to be here. So firstly, is social media blurring the line between life and death? Social media is exacerbating the fact that posthumous material sticks around. We've always blurred the line. I mean, we've always recorded what people say and it's always been available after they've passed away in many different ways. But I think on social media, because that material is more animated or more active perhaps, and because it's often driven by algorithms and bots, not just by what you happen to do there and then, the potential for that material to resurface or rearticulate in particular ways after you have passed away is much, much higher. And I think people forget that a lot of what we see on Facebook, for example, isn't live. You don't see what someone wrote two minutes ago. You might see what they wrote three weeks ago because the algorithm says that's the best time to see it. If you happen to pass away in the interim, that makes it pretty creepy. But it's not um, it's not untoward and it's not something that's that strange. But at the same time, it's something we're unfamiliar with and we do need to think about a bit. I suppose, you know, we're sort of warned be careful what you post on social media because it's not just a matter of deleting it these days. It does stick around. So Usually suppose... we're not told to be wary about it sticking around after we've died. Usually it's in yeah. the context of how it can hurt us when we're alive. That's it. Well, I think that the real challenge is we're not told anything about what happens to our staff after we pass away. I mean, most people struggle to remember to have a will. So the idea that we're going to spend any time thinking about our social media traces after we pass away is is laughable at best for most people. And yet, It is a very real issue, and I think we've seen enough cases in the world where that has posed a real problem, where, for example, people have passed away, relatives have been convinced that the the evidence of what's caused that, you know, especially if someone's taken their own life, is on their Facebook profile or on their messages or on their Instagram um, private messages, and for the most part, they've not been able to get access to that, and that poses a, a real challenge. So the the ethics and the rules around who can access what posthumously actually matter a great deal. How is this trending? I mean, what are the social media giants, if we'll call them that? Well, where are they trending towards this and what are they doing? Okay, so so looking into the future, I think so far we've got what we might call software engineers solutions. So Google, for example, has the, the most obviously um, software engineered solution. They have what's called an inactive account manager, which means that if you haven't logged in for a certain period of time, and the minimum amount of time you can set is three months, then you can set a bunch of rules for what should happen to your stuff. So you might want someone to get a download of all your YouTube videos. Someone else gets access to your Gmail account. Someone else gets the choice as to whether your your location history should be kept or deleted from your maps, for example. But three months is a really long time. I don't know if anyone's ever managed an estate posthumously, but the big questions about what you need to do with people's stuff come up within a week. You know, your email has the passwords to all of your financial um, accounts, for example, or, or something equally important. Waiting three months is not really an option if, if you're managing an estate. So it's a software solution that makes sense because three months seems a reasonable period of time as a minimum. But in the real world, that really doesn't help that much. There was a German case where a uh, a family was trying to gain access to uh, their deceased child's Facebook account after they had taken their own life. If a um, a child hasn't, if anyone I should say, has not given permission for their um, estate to access their social media, under what circumstances should they be able to? Well, should is a difficult question. It's, Mm -hmm. It's whether that should is a moral, an ethical or a legal. In legal terms, Facebook would argue that the right to privacy doesn't extinguish when you pass away. So they would say whatever your, your privacy expectations were when you're alive, that should persist. And, and that's been a hard line that they've taken and most software companies do because what they don't want to do is to become legal arbiters where they have to figure out what the right moral or ethical question is. They've taken a hard legal stance. In terms of ethical access, you would imagine any circumstances where there's a reasonable expectation that that material would reveal, especially to immediate family, something important about the circumstances in which someone passed away, that seems like a no-brainer, but it does come up against the law. And it's also the case where you would think 
that parents who are legal guardians should have that access, but that also is not true. So in the same way that most social media accounts are not supposed to let you have um, access until you're 13, that law also says the parents don't have a right of access in the same way. In terms of looking looking forward, though, I mean, in about 80 years' time, the statistics they're predicting will be there could be about 4.9 billion dead users on Facebook. It's uh, How is that going to be managed, though, in looking into the future? So Facebook's a really interesting example because they have probably the most developed response so far, which is they do allow you to memorialise an account. So if Facebook knows that someone's passed away, they could basically shift that to a memorialised setting which means that it will respect whatever the restrictions were on that account when you're alive. So it might mean that all of your close friends are allowed to post on your wall. People are allowed to um, post pictures. So profiles can become spaces of significant memorial. And that's um, as people are more dispersed across the globe, that's a really important space for a lot of people. It's a bit like, say, leaving a leaving a flower on a gravehead. Absolutely. Mm. And, it, and for some people, it is that simple. They will post an annual picture either on the day that they died or more often their birthday and remember them that way. And that's, um, for many people, a really important solution. But what will be interesting is that the only people usually that can access that account are the people that could see it while you're alive. So eventually, everyone that could access your account will also have passed away. So we will have this weird sort of thing where Facebook will be the arbiter of a lot of memorialized spaces that no one can actually see anymore. And, so and like how you die the second time yeah. when no one remembers you. Yeah, and, and, and I've, I've got a running theory that eventually Facebook will realize there's money in that, that actually it'll become like, who do you think you are, Facebook? Because you can actually go and access your ancestors' accounts eventually if it sticks around that long. That is very future looking. In terms of, obviously you said Facebook's quite advanced in, in this, in terms of memorialising pages. What are other um, sites doing? What, For example, Instagram, what are we seeing there? Are there any trends for the future? Well, the, what one hopes that the future will look different to what they currently do. Currently, Instagram will respect a request to delete an account after someone's died or they will lock it. So it doesn't tell you that it's a memorial account, but that will simply mean that no one else can have access. And if that material is public, it stays public, but nothing else can change. It's a pretty blunt, it's an all or nothing kind of choice. And I would suspect that going into the future, as more and more people pass away and their stuff remains on social media, we will get more and more nuanced responses. But certainly Instagram does not have a nuanced response right now. And nor, to be fair, to most other platforms. This is a relatively new question. It's not something, sadly, that is considered when platforms are designed. And it's usually only when there's some sort of controversy that they ever put the time in to design features that address what happens when a user dies. When, when I die, I'll, I'll be dead. I'll be dead from the neck up, dead from the neck down, etc., etc., etc. Why should I care? Who cares? It's, it doesn't affect me. I'm dead. It doesn't, there's no Facebook in wherever. Okay. So Why should I it guess matter? that the answer to that question to some extent then is, do you want a grave? Do you want to be buried? Do you care what happens to your remains? Because actually the question of what happens when we die isn't a question for us. It's a question for the people that we leave behind. Mm. And it's how they respond and how they want to respond to the memory of us. And I think that's where Facebook and other companies really don't quite know how important they are because they are the spaces in which we access most people when they're alive. We would expect that that's a space that we can still use when they pass away. And yet that's a, a level of uh, nuance and intimacy that those companies are, are really struggling with. And it's not just Facebook, it's, it's anywhere that you might create content that you share with someone that you expect that they will still be able to access at a later point in life. I suppose it's just another side of grieving. I mean, it's different for so many different people. And I suppose now with, you know, the presence of, of social media and how prevalent it is in our lives, it really does um, sort of dictate how we grieve, doesn't it? Absolutely. And, and in many ways, we see that that's being configured in different ways because, of course, people's grieving practices in the physical world is quite different. And sometimes that can come to conflict in memorial pages. So if you know someone that's passed away and one of their friends is posting something very religious, that's probably very well intended. But if you knew that that person was an atheist and did not want that sort of material on their page, you can see these weird little discussions mm. emerge where people are like, is that appropriate? Because that's not respecting who they were when they were alive. That can be a really difficult thing. At a, you know, if it's at a wake, it's usually done when you're drunk and, and that sort of conversation goes away. But on a memorial page, it sticks around. And do you, do you really want that sort of material on a memorial page is, is a difficult question. But we are wrestling with the best way to respect the dead in these spaces. We've touched a lot on um, social media and identity there and what happens when we pass away. But it's not just social media. It's also passwords are 
Email accounts. Email accounts, bank accounts. What is the future looking like in that sense? So I think for, for banks, at least, it's, rel- well, it's relatively well regulated. Yes, and of we, course. we know what can and can't happen there. But for any mm. industry that has, has emerged recently, then we need to really bake these questions in at the beginning. We need to know, we need to build accounts and, and platforms that allow for the whole of life setting and to have good answers as to what happens when someone passes away, even to have good practices for recognizing that. And do you need a death certificate? For example, Facebook used to require a death certificate before it would even entertain this conversation. And you used to have to go through an American court to present that death certificate. Thankfully, that's not as mm. as much the case now. They do have something called a, a legacy manager where you can nominate people while you're still alive who can certify that you've passed. What happens if you haven't done that prior to passing? Then you still have to go through an American court and present a death certificate. Wow. Although sometimes from my experience with uh, well, with someone who uh, I basically encountered this issue, there was an obituary published in the local paper and they accepted that to memorialise a page. But I'm sure to delete uh, a page, it would require quite a bit more. Yeah, so Facebook used to more actively seek out evidence and, and, mm. and act on that. But because there are so many people with the same name and because Facebook accidentally killed some of the wrong people effectively on their own platform because they had exactly the same name, they, they don't tend to do that as much anymore for fear of getting it wrong. And that's you know, so a realistic fear. So their, their approach has mainly just been reactive. They haven't sort of been thinking about this long term from when it was first created. They've just been responding, oh, no, people are worried about... Yeah, yeah so actually this, this issue first came up because Facebook has a recommendation system where it suggests new friends. Mm-hmm. And people are going, why are you suggesting that person? I know they're dead. So that was actually the first instance where Facebook had to go, oh, our algorithms are, are dealing with, with both the living and the dead, and we, we need to start addressing that. But identity isn't just when you pass, it's also the unborn. So if we can touch a little bit on that as well, what about the online profiles of the unborn or even children? Should there, should parents be creating social media footprints for those who can't really give their consent? It's a fantastic question and not one that we have good answers to yet, other than we need to think about it a lot better. Most parents, certainly for me and my generation, we don't have good examples of our parents having had to wrestle with these questions. Mm. So we're making it up as we go along. It's certainly true that it's almost a, a social media ritual now to post the first ultrasound photo. It's a moment of, of great joy and great sharing. But at the same time, it means that often the social media presence of someone starts before they're born, which is a, a kind of a strange thing to think about, especially when we're posting it often to platforms that make a living by building ghost profiles. As soon as an ultrasound is posted, we know that Facebook basically starts an entry expecting to fill in the details of that person over life because it's not just active account holders, it's knowing the people that that account holder cares about that actually matters in terms of selling. Um, There's some great experiments being done that show how radically your advertising changes within a minute of Facebook or Google knowing that you're pregnant, for example. Oh, yeah, it absolutely does. And I think we know that from all different stages of life, you post a, an engagement picture, well, then you're getting advertising around weddings, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. So, I mean, and not just um, the unborn. For example, I've come across a, a mummy blogger who has refused to release the names of her children for the fact that she'd like to protect them for when they're older in life. Are these things that maybe, um, not to criticise anyone, but people should be maybe thinking about in terms of their children and maybe they're not giving consent when they're 18 that mum shared all these really embarrassing stories about them? Absolutely. And I do think we we need to think about that more meaningfully. One of the things that happens when you have a kid in Western Australia, at least, is you get handed this huge purple book with all of the the growth norms, all of the things about immunisation, all of the contact people in terms of health professionals and, and things to think about. There's lots in there. And one page that says you are going to almost certainly post pictures of your kids online. Have a quick think about your privacy settings. Have a quick think about who you want to be able to see that photo and whether that really needs to be public or whether you think that your account should be just directed at close family and friends. Something that simple, I think, would be really meaningful and useful. Eventually, we'll have best practice. We'll, we'll have normalized ways of having this uh, discussion. But even today, if I, if I take my kids to a birthday party, some parents will be snap happy and all of those photos will end up on Facebook. Others will be really privacy conscious and not want photos of their kids. And sometimes those discussions can be quite tense at, at a kid's birthday party. In the future, are we going to be having uh, chatbots with unborn children or chatbots with dead people? Actually, probably more likely dead people, that sort of thing. What direction are we heading and how fast are we pummeling towards it? 
So one of the, the things that is interesting is when, um, if we go back to, to thinking posthumously, we do leave a lot of traces behind. And for something like a chat bot or something like a, a system that's, that's powered by voice, if you've got 500 voice recordings, you can pretty much build something that will sound like that person's voice. If you've got a really detailed history of their life, then instead of reading their life as a book or a series of letters or a series of posts, you could pretty much design now, and, and companies are designing, interfaces where you can ask someone who's passed away to tell you the story of their life in their voice. Now, that's not artificial intelligence, but it certainly feels like it. If, if you get a meaningful response to a question from a dead relative in a computer interface, it feels like an intelligent response, even if it's just activating a recording. So that and, and we're at the infancy of those sort of tools, but I think as more and more of our stuff gets left behind on social media, the value of adding it together collecting it and that being actually a really significant part of history is increasingly um, the case. So it's really a growing space in terms of what it's going to be like for when we pass, but also for the unborn generations, isn't it? Absolutely. So I, th I think if you're being born today or if you're d even if you're dying today, the questions of what happens to your stuff on social media is something that needs more thought and, and more research. I think that brings us to the end of our discussion today. Thank you very much for coming along, Tama. It was really, really interesting. A um, lot going on in this space. <laughs> a lot going on, a lot more to happen. Kind of scary, but also very exciting as well. The future is always exciting. If it's scary, it's because we haven't got good answers yet. You've been listening to The Future Of, a podcast powered by Curtin University. If you have any questions about today's topic, get in touch by following the links in our show notes. Bye for now. <laughs>